Now then, how are you doing? I hope you're well. Let's talk about tone. Well, just to be clear, when we do talk about tone or tonal values, we're referring to the lightness or darkness of an object, irrespective of its colour. And when we place a light object right next to a dark one, they naturally create a contrast. Now, I go as far as to say that getting your tonal values and contrasts right in a painting is as important, if not more important, than your choice of colours. Another thing I think is important to understand is that tone is relative. What that means is if we want something to look particularly bright in our painting, then the way to achieve that effect is to place something extremely dark right next to it. Or vice versa. So here's a question for you. Which of these squares is the lightest? Well, the answer is both are the same. And here's the proof. In fact, you don't have to take my word for it. You can do this yourself. Draw yourself a couple of squares or a square within a square. Mix up a light paints grey. Carefully paint both inner squares with the same colour. And then when it's dry, paint each of the outer squares in turn, one darker than the other, and compare. It's a simple exercise, but one that illustrates tonal relativity quite effectively, I think. In any watercolour painting, the lightest element you can have is the white of the paper. Of course, in the real world, there are far more values at work than just black and white. Between those two extremes, there's a broad spectrum of tones available for us to play with and construct our scene from. One of the biggest threats to any composition is that of tonal boredom. Well, this is likely to occur when you have objects placed alongside each other that are different in colour, but share the same or very similar tonal values. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that such an occurrence creates a visual weak spot and may undermine or weaken the whole composition. Or to put it simply, those two adjacent objects might be sporting different colours, but if they have the same tonal value, then there would be no way to differentiate between them if you were to remove the colour information. They would blend into each other and essentially become a single object. It would be very difficult to separate them. Well, one of the easiest ways in which we can illustrate the importance of tone and to increase our tonal awareness is to take a colour photo and remove its colour information. Well, this is the Packhorse Bridge at Watendlath in the Lake District. The photo's in colour, but it's lacking in contrast. It's rather bland, in fact. Well, watch what happens when I remove that colour information. Many of the greys and greens are blending into one another, inducing that tonal boredom I was talking about. So let's turn the colour back on again and adjust it slightly, increasing its overall contrast. Well, this time, when we remove the colour information, the result is much clearer. The image is now considerably stronger and far easier to understand. So, if you're going to paint a picture, any picture, I would always recommend starting out by taking the time to explore its tonal properties. And I have to say at this point that this applies to painters of all levels of skill and experience, not just beginners. Understanding the tonal properties of your subject is as important as understanding the shapes and colours within it. But if you get into the habit of thinking tonally, then your painting will almost certainly improve exponentially. 
As a general rule, it's a good idea to produce a preliminary sketch, either in pencil or paint, to help you identify where the lightest and darkest tones are, and how all the values in between those extremes are distributed. If you have got objects that clash tonally by being the same or too similar in value and placed alongside each other, then that resulting lack of definition means the scene may be difficult to understand. And here's the good news. If the subject you're working from doesn't have good contrasts or a pleasing distribution of values, then we are allowed to modify things engineer those tones in order to make our composition stronger or simply more coherent. Always remember, it's your interpretation, so no modification is off the table. If something looks better by being made darker or lighter, then don't spend any time at all worrying about whether you should or shouldn't. Life's too short. Just do it. Well, by far the best way to understand all this stuff is to paint yourself a picture or two using only a single colour. There's even better news. A tonal study doesn't have to be anything overly ambitious. In fact, it doesn't have to have any finesse at all. Its primary function is for you to explore the tonal properties of a scene. It doesn't have to be a masterpiece. Even better, most folks actually report finding the process to be quite liberating. It's a one-pot painting, after all. With all that in mind, let's return to what end laugh. Well, if you're going to paint yourself a tonal study, then it needs to be in a colour that has a broad tonal range. Cadmium yellow, for instance, would be rubbish for the job. No matter how heavily you mix it, you'll never get good strong values out of it. Well, my colour of choice, and one that I always recommend for this exercise, is Payne's Grey, but really it could be anything you fancy. Sepia has a long tradition for this sort of task, for example, or you could use something darker. Neutral tint is good. Take your pick. Whichever colour you pick, make sure it has a broad tonal range. Something you can mix up thickly to produce good, strong tones, or water right down to create light, delicate tones. Between those two extremes, the more values you have to work with, the better. By the way, if you've used Payne's Grey from different paint manufacturers, you may notice that they all look slightly different. Why is this? I don't know either. It can be frustrating. Just for the record, Payne's Grey was originally mixed from Prussian Blue, Yellow Ochre and Crimson Lake. You can also mix your own from French Ultramarine and Burnt Sienna. Well, as you can see, I've decided to dive straight into this without any pre-drawing. My initial mix is weak and pale, and I'm simply applying it to most of the elements within the scene, establishing its general layout and making sure to leave a few untouched highlights in all the key areas. 
Remember, the object of the exercise is to produce a painting using a single colour, but one where its tonal values are distributed in such a way as to make it legible. It's also worth remembering that the brightest tone available to us is white, where the paper remains untouched. It's a one-pot painting, where the only colour used is Payne's Grey. Once I'm happy with my first wash, it's a simple process of increasing the intensity of the mix by adding further pigment to it to make it darker. It's important not to go too dark too quickly. Working with a single colour can be surprisingly liberating. It means we don't have to think about mixing anything else. The only thing I have to think about is whether or not I'm creating the necessary contrasts to make the scene understandable. The process rather beautifully exploits the primary notion common to all watercolour paintings, that of working from light to dark. Naturally, it's important to try and leave those crucial highlights along the top of the bridge untouched. If I was to forget, then the grey of the stone would blend into the grey of the field beyond, and the definition would be lost. I love painting tonal studies for all the reasons I've mentioned. It makes for a valuable preliminary exercise when planning an important painting. But I should also say that I just find them rather fun to do. This is a little rough at the edges, could use some finesse, but hopefully it conveys my visual message clearly and unambiguously. And in the end, that's all I'm really aiming for. Well, I hope some of that may have been useful to you. Understanding tone and the importance of properly calibrated and distributed values is one of the core skills every new watercolour painter should endeavour to learn. And that doesn't have to be a slog or a trial. Have a bit of fun with it. Paint yourself a few simple pictures in a single colour. And believe me, it'll all start to make perfect sense. Well, I'm going to be back with more watercolour basics very soon. So if you've enjoyed this video, please do hit the like button. And if you've not already done so, please consider subscribing to my channel. More in-depth guidance and advice is, of course, available through my online tuition service. Details of how to subscribe to that are in the description below. In the meantime, keep watching what happens on the paper and enjoy. Until the next time, take care.